make it gay. I gotta find my brother. My body is ready. I'm here with my man Richard Tisame, the president of Nintendo of America. You're battling enemies here. Yeah. You're going to be sending arrows from the game pad right to these enemies. You're doing good. I'm You're doing good. good. Yeah. You've got yeah. unlimited yeah. arrows. Just keep Come on! Going. Team, we're going to be powering through some meetings all day today, but to keep us going, I got us some snacks. Bill! 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 This is, not the this is the Nintendo Switch. This is oh, I'm geeking out! I'm geeking out right now! Thank you, thank you, thank you so much for that warm and gracious introduction, welcome. Uh, we're here to kick off story time here at PAX 2003. Woo! 2003, is that a time warp? What is that? 2023. You know, it, it, that was a bit of a Freudian slip because I have attended so many PAX events, not in 2003, but I was here at the very first PAX event. Uh, at times, surprising uh, the Nintendo teams that would be staffing our booths, uh, creating quite a commotion as I would walk the floor. The thing about PAX that I always loved was the opportunity to interact with the fans and with the community. Because you all are what make this industry so special. You all are what make this event so special. So it's a really wonderful opportunity for me to be here and to share some thoughts and to share some, uh, some of my history and some of my thinking uh, here on this stage. And I'm incredibly honored to be this year's Storytime Speaker. So now in retirement, uh, as well as really throughout my career, I would often get asked the same question or some derivative of the same question. And it's this. How did you do it? How did you navigate your career? How did you get to work for Nintendo? How did you get to work for all of these wonderful brands and businesses like MTV, like Guinness, like Pizza Hut? Each one. All these fantastic brands. How did you do it? Were you lucky? Well, 
People who know me know that I don't believe in luck. I believe in something else. I believe in the power of having great capability and matching that capability with great opportunity. Yeah. That when you have these two elements, capability meeting opportunity, this is how you're able to make your own luck happen. And that's the subject of today's talk. Capability meeting opportunity. And I'll share what I mean by these concepts. And I'll give you some real examples from my life. And my hope is that you'll be able to take these concepts and apply them to your own situation. Whether you're just starting off your career, whether you're a seasoned executive that's out there somewhere in the audience or watching this on one of the PAC's social channels, whether you're a student, whether you're just trying to figure out what your own journey will be, hopefully you'll be able to take some lessons and some insight from this talk today. But first, let me share a couple definitions for what I mean by capability and what I mean by opportunity. Capability is the sum knowledge and collection of your experiences that you build throughout your lifetime. It's what you build through your education. It's what you build through your your situation in life. It's what you build by exploring topics of interest. It's what you build by reading, by listening to podcasts. All of your life experiences rolled up together is what creates your capability. And these experiences build and increase your ability to apply them in different situations. And that's the opportunity. The opportunity are those special situations where you can apply what you've learned. It could be a new project at work, or it could be some assignment at school, a new professor, a mentor, someone you've come in contact with. Maybe it's sitting in a presentation that hopefully makes you think a little bit in terms of what it means to have new opportunities. These are all situations where you get to try out a new skill or a new behavior, or reapply a behavior that you haven't quite mastered yet. Does that make sense? In terms of the two definitions around capability and opportunity? And so I'm gonna break down what I mean by capability meeting opportunity into five key concepts. And for each one, we'll go into some detail and give some examples. So the first concept is that your past doesn't define your future. Next, you need to learn from the best. You need to say yes to challenges. And when you fail, and inevitably you will, you need to fail forward. And then lastly, you need to make and live with difficult decisions. Now, I'm showing this as a nice, tidy flywheel, but life isn't tidy. You don't go from one experience to the next as I've shown it here. You bounce around in these different concepts throughout your life. But I want you to think about it in terms of a journey, in terms of how you will go about creating your capability 
and living life in the moment to take charge of those opportunities. So we're going to focus on the first concept, that your past does not define your future. I can't tell you how many times I meet people who get stuck living in the past, who get stuck thinking about situations where maybe they weren't successful or maybe they wish they had done something differently. My position is you can't change your past. But what you need to do is you need to think about it and you need to apply all of those learnings, all of those experiences as you move forward. And let me give you an example. Aww. Yes, this is me. This is me at about two years old. Picture taken by one of my parents when we were living in the Bronx. My parents were born in Haiti. They were college educated there, but came to the United States to escape the brutal dictatorship that was happening in the country at that time at the hands of someone by the name of Francois Duvalier. They were college educated, as I said, but when they came to the US, they needed to learn English on the fly. Right. They took on menial jobs right at the start. They settled in the Bronx, New York, where my brother and I were born. This is another photo of me at about four years old. I love the attitude in this photo. Yeah. That's the Reginator at four years old. <laughs> we lived in a one bedroom apartment at the top floor of a five story walk up tenement building. It was a rough area. The building itself was infested with mice and roaches. Uh, there was a stabbing in the building. There were gang fights. My brother and I were mugged the same year that this photo was taken. I was four years old, he was six years old. Yeah, it was a rough, rough space. And the fact is that, you know, I'm not unique. I'm not the only person who's grown up in a rough area. I was fortunate to have a loving family. I was, uh, you know, in a great situation that my family moved out of the Bronx when I was about eight years old. They created the opportunity for me to have a different life and a better future. And just as importantly, I took on the mindset to improve myself, to focus on the future and not on the past so that neither me nor my own family would face similar hardships. Again, I believe that the past may shape us, but it doesn't define us. It doesn't dictate our future. And you need to have determination to take those experiences from your past and be able to move forward. That's the first concept. The next concept is that I firmly believe you need to learn from the best. And again, when I get asked about you know, how I was able to uh, move myself forward in life, this is the example that I most often refer to. How I challenge young people that you need to make sure you are learning from the best. The best that you have the opportunity to learn from. And that's because this journey is a continuous opportunity to learn. Here's what I mean. Even back in the Bronx, in those tough situations, I was focused on trying to learn, trying to better myself. I applied myself in school, was able to get good grades. My parents, when we were living in the Bronx, scraped up what to them was a small fortune at the time and bought us a world book encyclopedia set. You know, one of these 26 volume encyclopedias. 
I read that from cover to cover when we were still living in the Bronx. I was focused on learning. I was focused on trying to find ways to better myself. I saw education as the pathway to greater capability and more opportunity. I had great grades. I took advanced classes, scored well on all the standardized tests that were offered. And this led to literally hundreds of colleges sending me their brochures and their material. I literally kept all these in a closet in my room uh, when we had moved to Long Island. Now, as I said earlier, my parents had attended university in Haiti, but they had no idea how to counsel me to navigate this college search here in the United States. On top of that, I went to high school in this massive school district. I had 700 other students in my graduating class, 700. So when you think about the guidance counselors that were giving information to all of the juniors and all of the seniors, that's 1,400 students that they were trying to counsel, which was like getting no information at all. So I had to navigate figuring out how to get into a good university. And I was focused on getting into the best university I could and having a plan to pay for it. Because I wanted to make sure that I, I had the opportunity to learn from the best. I was accepted into Cornell University and their undergraduate business program. First time I saw the campus was when I was moving in uh, as a freshman for class orientation. But I was able to immerse myself in a continuous learning situation, a situation that nurtured my curiosity and allowed me to excel. At Cornell, I had leadership opportunities. I was president of my college fraternity. I had the opportunity to practice my leadership and mentoring capabilities by being a teaching assistant during my junior and senior years. I was able to create great capability during my time at Cornell. But just as importantly, Cornell presented a fantastic opportunity that I was able to grab onto. And that was the opportunity to learn business management at Procter & Gamble. But first, imagine this, right? I envisioned my career path to be in finance. That's what I was studying at Cornell. I had interned at a bank during my summer in between junior and senior year. I had job offers early on during my senior year from a number of different banks. That was the path that I envisioned myself. But early in my second semester, senior year, an opportunity came up. I was asked to interview for P&G's brand management program. Unbeknownst to me, a couple of my professors had put my name forward for this prestigious opportunity, even without asking me if I was interested. But the more I looked into this program, the more I liked what I learned. The program was multifaceted, a hands-on approach to learning how to run a business, which in the end was my ultimate objective. I learned about sales, marketing, advertising, product distri distribution. I learned about product development. I learned about pricing and demand management, business strategy, market dynamics. Truly a world-class program. 
At the time, P&G hired about 100 people a year into the US-based brand management program. More than 90% were graduates with an advanced degree. Typical, typically a master's in business administration, but other advanced degrees, uh, and many of them were much older than I was at the time because they had gained work experience before getting this advanced degree. You know, here I am, I'm about 22 years old, and the people who are competing with me for this assignment are later in their 20s, many in their early 30s. But if hired, it would create a significant opportunity. I ended up being literally one of five undergrads that were hired into the P&G brand management program for the US that year. And I spent about eight years at Procter & Gamble honing my business management skills and my people le leadership capability. And again, it was this flywheel of capability building and opportunities that allowed me to grow and progress to the point where you know, in my very early 30s, I was one of the most senior African-American executives in the operating line of business for Procter & Gamble. It, this principle of learning from the best continued throughout my career, but especially at Nintendo. For example, learning from my boss, my friend, my mentor, Satoru Iwata. The plaque over his head is Japanese for create something unique. Create something unique, which is the driving mantra at Nintendo. It's this relentless performance of always looking for new ideas, bringing new experiences to players and to the marketplace that has defined Nintendo's over 130 year record of success. And this idea of create something unique perfectly dovetailed my own passion for disruptive innovation and relentless pushing of new ideas. It was a fantastic opportunity. And I was able to learn from many people at Nintendo, including arguably the best game developer of all time, oh, Shigeru yeah. Miyamoto. And this is uh, me and Mr. Miyamoto at the Nintendo store in New York City celebrating Super Mario's 25th anniversary. Opportunities to learn from these two legendary people are among my most treasured memories at Nintendo. And being thought of a member of the Nintendo Triforce was truly humbling. <laughs> but the fact is, Nintendo has many world-class developers and executives and I was able to learn uh, and, and interact and, and help teach uh, even some of these, uh, these folks. You know, helping them understand marketing and, and all of the things that I brought to the company. You know, here, in addition to being with Mr. Miyamoto in the front row, I'm with Takashi Tezuka. Now, if Mr. Miyamoto is Mario's father, then Mr. Tezuka is Mario's uncle. He was there from the very beginning. And then in the back is Shinya Takahashi, who's currently leading all game development for Nintendo, and Katsuya Iguchi, best known as the director for the very first Animal Crossing, and currently one of the deputy game development directors at Nintendo. 
So learning from the best and putting yourself on this continuous learning journey, to me, is a key concept in this idea of capability meeting opportunity. Next concept, saying yes to challenges. Now, when confronted with a challenge or growth experience that's exceedingly challenging, it's oftentimes easy to say, no thanks. Right? I, ra I rather not take on this new challenge or this challenging assignment. But in my career, when I would be offered up these challenging opportunities, you know, these opportunities that seemed outside of my skill set at the time, my approach, rather than shying away from the opportunity, was to embrace it, to say yes to these challenges. And it's more than stepping out of your comfort zone. It really is setting yourself up to add to your capability and to use this opportunity, in the words of Nintendo, to create something unique. It's a deliberate choice to stretch your capabilities. And so let me give a couple examples. The first, completely outside of the video game industry, and it deals with my time at Panda Management Company uh, and uh, their brands, Panda Inn, as well as their quick service concept, Panda Express. Now, broadly speaking, high quality Chinese food is the last bastion of the mom and pop restaurant operator. There are just not many chains in the Chinese food service industry. Panda Express was looking to change that. Their legacy is in fine dining. Their very first restaurant concept was Panda Inn. They sit down, white cloth, full service restaurants that served fantastic Chinese and Pan Asian food. These were top rated restaurants, very cutting edge. The company leveraged all of this knowledge and experience from these full service Panda Inns to create their quick service concept. Panda Express. And Panda Express would typically be in uh, high traffic locations, mall food courts, college campuses, worker campuses, airports, locations where there were a lot of people waiting to be served. My role when I joined the company was marketing and product development. But I was charged with creating a new type of Panda Express quick service restaurant that could be on any street corner in the world. The idea was for this restaurant to be the volume driver for this chain and allow the company to expand not only throughout the United States, but throughout the world. Now let me pause here for a moment. First, Panda Express had tried to create this concept many times before I got there. They had taken their mall concept with steam tables, serving two or three item combos, a pretty rigid format. They had taken this and simply transferred it to a street corner, thinking that that was going to be the successful adaptation of the formula. They failed. It just didn't work. 
it was not the right type of concept for a neighborhood restaurant that has different types of consumers during the lunchtime and then during dinner time. Dinner time. They all fail. But second, I was the marketing guy. What did I know about creating a brand new concept for this company? Plus, I had just joined. I was still trying to figure out how to move marketing ideas and product ideas within this company. It would have been easy to decline the challenge, but instead I embraced it. And I set about asking a ton of questions. Questions to the kitchen staff, both at Panda Inn and at Panda Express, trying to understand what we would need to do differently to create a concept that would work. I talked to our customers, trying to understand what they wanted in this type of neighborhood situation. I went into our competitors and mystery shopped all of these other outlets, not only in the Chinese food space, but other competitors that would be directly competing with what we were trying to do. Taco Bells of the world, uh, you know, chicken outlets, the whole nine yards. I needed to get smart about the opportunity. I talked to our real estate team to understand what would be involved in trying to build out this concept. How we should think about things like delivery and drive through I was driven to figure out how we could create a concept that would work and meet the challenge that I was given. The one thing I knew I had to start with was the core of the brand, the core of the business was the highest quality Chinese food. But everything else needed to change. The menu needed to be broader. The portion sizes needed to be different. I needed to conceptualize how we would do business during lunch and then during dinner time. The restaurant design needed to be different. We needed to have space for people to sit down and eat there, as well as for people to take food on the go. Everything needed to be thought through and to be challenged and to be approached differently in order for this concept to be created and to work. But all of this change created complexity. I need to figure out how to simplify this complexity in order to have a restaurant that not only would serve its customers, but would also be profitable. This was the result. The very first successful Panda Express street store. This is the one that my team and I built and created in Southern California. The economics were that each one of these restaurants, and this is back in the mid 1990s, but at the time, each of these restaurants needed to do about a million dollars in revenue in order for it to be successful. This is inside of the restaurant. So customers could see peaks of the kitchen reinforcing the quality. There are no visible steam tables. There's an extensive menu of food options and the ability to constantly bring new recipes into the marketplace. There were dinner-sized portions. Fast service was the standard. The end result was that this restaurant and the ones that followed vastly exceeded that million dollar benchmark. They've been successfully launching these across the world ever since. Another example of saying yes to challenges. Coming on board to be the executive vice president 
of sales and marketing for Nintendo. You know, it's important to remember the status of the gaming market back in 2003. So Sony's PlayStation 2 had launched in the second half of calendar 2000. And it was already the runaway market leader by the time I was approached by Nintendo. PS2 had disrupted the industry by leveraging backwards compatibility. First time it had been done in the home console space. So they were able to build off all of the success that they had with the original PlayStation. They also leveraged DVD technology. And in fact, the PS2 was the cheapest DVD player that you could get at the time. So that anyone who wanted to upgrade their home theater, they were able to do it and get a gaming console at the same time. But there was another key benefit in leveraging DVD technology. That was the cost of replicating all of those game discs. Substantially cheaper than what Nintendo had been doing at the time, for example, utilizing ROM-based technology. And the smart thing that PS2 did was they passed all of those cost savings and replication to their third-party development network. So third-party developers were able to make substantially more margin selling their games on PS2. And that generated a tremendous amount of loyalty amongst all of the developers. Key differentiator and innovation that PlayStation 2 was able to bring to the market. Nintendo's GameCube had launched holiday of 2001. And it was technically a very strong machine, and it boasted an incredible first party lineup right at launch. Luigi's Mansion, Super Smash Brothers Melee, the, the original Animal Crossing. But then there was about a year long gap until the next wave of fantastic software. Metroid Prime, mm. uh, Legend of Zelda, The Wing Wing. When I was interviewing for the role, Nintendo was in the middle of another extended gap between launching fantastic software. But the most telling issue with GameCube was that while I was an avid video game player at the time, with past Nintendo machines and a PS2 in my house, there wasn't yet a GameCube among my gaming library. I myself had not yet been compelled to buy the machine. And my own questions about GameCube's value proposition were reinforced as I went out and visited retail locations before my interviews with Nintendo. And what I heard from retail clerks was that the inventory of GameCube was piling up in the back of the store, that the sales momentum for the machine had really slowed. And another competitor had entered the scene. Microsoft's Xbox also launched during the holiday of 2001. Now, I have to apologize for this slide because it's not the scale. <laughs> <laughs> To fully capture the size of the original Xbox and that Duke controller would really make my slide out of balance. So just, just, for, just for visual sake, we're going to go back to the original. So Xbox had the, uh, had Halo, 
and the promise of connected play as critical elements for their proposition. And they were in this fight for the long term. The company was willing to hemorrhage losses until they had the developer network, the, uh, the, the infrastructure, the games to be successful in the marketplace. So Nintendo was in a difficult situation on the home console front. But things got worse. E3 2003, Sony announced that they were going after Nintendo's dominance in the handheld market. So remember, at the time, Game Boy was a profit printing machine for Nintendo. And so this move by PlayStation was literally going at Nintendo's juggling. Sony showed off their new uh, medium, the disc for their machine, uh, the UMB. And the new games, the new system's name, the PSP. And on these pieces of news, and only these pieces of news, right? No games, no hardware, no pricing. But just on these pieces of news, Nintendo stock took a 10% haircut on the day of that announcement. Wow. So joining Nintendo in 2003 was a high-risk move. But I said yes to that challenge and the trajectory of my own life and this video game industry changed forever. Next concept, failing forward. So as I said earlier, the fact is we are all going to fail at times. Life is not just an endless, rolling uh, set of experiences that are successes. Right. I believe the key is how you react in those failures. The fact that you need to dust yourself off, get back up, and approach that challenge again, and maybe again, in order to eventually be successful. You have to be able to learn from your misstep and apply those learnings moving forward. To be able to take action and literally get back in the game again and to do it successfully. So I'm gonna drive this home with a Nintendo example. Nintendo's home console transition following the Wii. So, the Wii sold over 100 million systems. Right. It disrupted the gaming industry with motion control, and it brought millions of new consumers into the industry. And by the time it's life cycle ended, we had sold the second most home consoles in video game history, second only to the PS2. <laughs> it's no secret that <laughs> Nintendo's follow-on to the massively successful Wii, the Wii U, did not capture the, uh, the emotions and the pocketbooks of our consumers. Wii U sold only 13 million systems. Yes. Second worst performance of a system in Nintendo's history. Second only to the disastrous virtual. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Luckily, I had nothing to do with that. <laughs> of course. 
the innovation of the Wii U was the tablet-like controller called the gamepad. And from the gamepad, you could do a variety of different things, right? You could have information for the game that you're playing on your main screen of, of your TV, things like your inventory or your stats, uh, as an example. Alternatively, alternatively, developers chose to create a completely different experience for the player holding the gamepad from everyone else uh, in a particular game, so you could do that. And then lastly, you could play your game 100% on the gamepad and have the TV playing regular content. The challenge there is you had to be at least 30 feet close to the main system, otherwise you would lose the connection. Mm. But even though the Wii U underperformed in the marketplace, we heard a clear and distinct piece of feedback from the player. They said they loved this opportunity to be able to play games on their main TV or to be able to take the gamepad and play the game 100% on that screen separately on the go. Universally, consumers were saying, we love this idea of a big, you know, 10 foot experience with your big screen as well as a 10 inch experience with the gamepad held up close. And it was this key insight that was foundational for the Nintendo Switch, which followed quickly thereafter, right? The consumer would never need to leave their game playing behind. They could play on, at home on their beautiful big screen or take the Switch out of its dock and play on the go. And when you're on the go, you can set it up on a table, detach the remote controllers, give it to a friend, you know, all of these different experiences that you could have with the Nintendo Switch. And the innovation that were that put into the controllers, the Joy-Con, it was, it was a tremendous amount of investment. Each one has rumble capability and motion capability. One incorporates infrared capability so you can see objects in the real world. The other has near field communication. These were all significant innovations that were put into the system and they represented significant risk. And so again, you have to think about this. 2017, Wii U had not worked in the marketplace at all. And Nintendo decides to pivot with all of this technology, this new approach with the Nintendo Switch. And the risk paid off. The Switch is now the clear number two best-selling home console in video games. And it's been a massive success, not only for Nintendo, but for all of the developers who've created content for the system. It's a classic example of failing forward, dusting yourself off, analyzing what worked, what didn't work, and applying yourself again. The final concept, making and living with difficult decisions. Now, in life, we make decisions every day. Most of these are easy. Blue shirt or white shirt? Jacket or no jacket? Yeah. Easy decisions. But every once in a while, you're faced with a difficult decision to make. Right. Some people pull back from this opportunity. They wring their hands. 
They, they put off making the decision. Or they don't even make the decision at all. Yeah. No. I believe you need to face these difficult decisions head on with the best information that you have. And most importantly, live and learn from the consequences. Right. So let's go back in history to the planning for the week. It truly was a groundbreaking device driven by Nintendo's sound understanding of the marketplace at the time. Back in the early to mid 2000s, only about one out of every three people played video games. And right before the launch of the Wii, as well as the Nintendo DS, the sales of software had actually stagnated and was beginning to decline in certain markets like Japan. Others in the business community at the time thought that simply increasing the visual capability of the next machine would solve the problems of the industry. They believed that more photorealistic visuals were the answer, that that would move out from this malaise and get the consumer re-engaged in gaming. Nintendo saw the situation different. That people were not playing games because the games were not very interesting. You know, at that time, you know, there were a ton of sequels, right? Version five, six, seven of a particular franchise. And the differences were not very significant. So consumers were choosing to skip version five Maybe I'll just wait for version number seven of my favorite franchise. Also, controllers had gotten way too complex. I mean, I remember playing on the GameCube controller. I think I counted, there were 12 or 13 different input buttons. <laughs> Things had gotten to the point where consumers were getting less and less motivated pick up a controller, and to play a game. There was a lack of fun in the category. Nintendo's solution was the Wii and the Wii Remote. The thought was showing how the nature of the interface and the gameplay could be changed and to imbue the games with much more fun to get people literally up off the couch and engaged with this form of entertainment. So you could play tennis like you were swinging a racket or hit a baseball as if you were swinging a bat. The technology in the Wii Remote was not overly complex, which generated healthy profit margins for the company. And the consumer reaction literally was a step, right? And as I said, systems sold over 100 million units for the first two, two and a half years, the company could not keep the system in stock at retail. There was one key business decision that led to these results. And it was the decision to include Wii Sports in the consumer proposition in the Americas and in Europe. And it was these markets that outperformed the rest of the world in driving not only Wii hardware, but Wii software as well. And I can tell you this was a hotly contested decision. Quite rightly, the game developers saw the software as fantastic. They wanted the software to be sold individually at $50 each MSRP. But 
I knew there was power in having instant fun out of the box right. with weed. And it was important to show the core proposition right when the consumer brought the hardware home. And Wii Sports really defined the genre-breaking nature of Wii. And it, it highlighted our desire to make Wii a mass market system. And I can tell you, it was a gutsy call. It took me months to convince Mr. Iwata and Mr. Miyamoto to pack in Wii Sports. And in fact, even in making the decision, you know, they, they differed with me a bit because Wii Sports was not packed in in Japan. Interesting. Only in the US and Europe. So literally, it was a bit of a, uh, a test as to which approach really would move the marketplace forward most aggressively. And in point of fact, the Americas and Europe dominated the overall sales and sales pace for the week. It was this decision that led to the phenomenon of people playing Wii Sports in bars and in retirement homes. I mean, remember, you know, people having Wii bowling contests, people having experiences with Wii Sports and all of these untraditional spaces. It was because of the packing of Wii Sports into the overall proposition. It literally was a billion dollar decision. It made gaming history. So there you have it. These are my five concepts that highlight how capability meeting opportunity can create breakthrough moments. And again, as I said, you know, don't, don't overly focus on the pretty picture. You bounce around from these concepts throughout your life all the time. But it's meant to show how if you truly work on building your capability and face opportunity head on, you can make your own luck. So these concepts, as well as uh, other concepts, are highlighted in my book, Disrupting the Game from the Bronx to the Top of Nintendo. And there are a limited number of signed copies here at PAX. Uh, so I encourage you, if, if you like these stories, uh, and are interested in some of my lessons, I encourage you to go pick up a copy. For those who are watching this uh, on the web, uh, the book is broadly available. And there's an audio book narrated by a fantastic storyteller. That's me. <laughs> yeah! And the, uh, the audio book also has uh, a lot of bonus content that I recorded with Jeff Keeley. Well, so uh, it's a really fun listen uh, that I encourage you to, to pick up as well. One of the things that I'm proud of, uh, yes, the book was a Wall Street Journal uh, bestseller at launch, but it's also received over 1,500 five-star reviews, uh, which I'm incredibly proud of. And I've gotten letters from uh, readers and parents and and folks on how much they've enjoyed the book uh, and how the lessons were, uh, were really uh, inspiring. Uh, so I encourage you to pick up a copy. So uh, we have a few minutes and we're gonna uh, take some questions. And to help me navigate the questions, I'm going to invite uh, Ryan Hartman uh, up on the stage. Ryan is the VP at uh, Penny Arcade, and I like to call him the king of packs. I mean, he literally uh, runs packs, all of the different experiences. Hello. Hello. Hi. 
That was great. Let's hear it for Reggie. That was fantastic. That was so good. Yeah, so. That's a good one. Is it? Hello. I would have said, if I would have said, she has been so Hope everyone likes the new digs. Okay, yeah, no, uh, let's do it. Yeah. Let's do that. So, in talking before this, uh, and when doing the planning for this uh, talk, we prepared for the eventuality there would be a little extra time, and if you've been paying attention to the PAX social accounts at all, we put a form up for uh, Q&A requisition, and we've got thousands of questions and submissions from across the planet, uh, and once Laura and I went through all of them, and took out all the mother three questions. There were, <laughs> of course, there were seven just no lies so, detected. So we'll jump through as many as we can real quick. So just think of me as a nasally text to speech, <laughs> or the voice of the people. There you go. Right. Uh. Okay. So jumping right in. First question: Carter Jackson from Sherwood, Oregon, asks, "You talk in your book about how you have often learned various lessons throughout your career." It seems like there were quite a lot of lessons that you learned early on. Is there anything you would say now to anyone who is still early in their journey? Sure. So, you know, again, some of this we touched on during the talk today in terms of, you know, we are all on continuous learning journeys. You know, the power of increasing your toolbox learning things is incredibly important. But the, the one thought that I would leave you with, right, whatever station in life you're at, it's the power of asking questions. Yeah. The power of asking questions. So, you know, early in your career, late in your career, asking critical questions really sets you up to understand an issue, to be able to address the issue, uh, and to be able to move forward. So one of the things I was known for uh, at Nintendo, right, if it wasn't clear up top, I would pepper people with questions, right? Why are we here? What are we trying to accomplish in this meeting, on this phone call? What are we trying to do? And just driving clarity by asking questions is really a, a, a big overall thought I would leave you with as you think about just how do I how do I move forward effectively in life? Mm. Ask questions. Great advice. Uh, I agree, 100%. All right, and you're going to ask me a question? Yeah. Next question. Are you ready for the next question? Uh, L from Oklahoma asks. If you chose a different career in life, what would it be and why? <laughs> so, uh, if I wasn't you know, an executive, uh, if, if I didn't go into banking, which I didn't, um, I would have loved to have been a teacher. Mm. Right? Mm. Why do I say Isn't that? I mean, you know, right now, uh, in retirement, um, I have the great opportunity to spend time at Cornell spend time on other college campuses, interact with young people, let, give lectures uh, and big speeches. And so for me, the opportunity to share knowledge, to help shape uh, people's like thinking, to long. encourage them to approach things differently is something that I truly love doing today. And, and I, I could see myself having been a teacher. I mean, here in this convention center, a couple years ago, I attended a, a big symposium of college uh, professors and administrators, and I really enjoyed it. And so if, if I were doing something else, uh, I would be a teacher, college professor, something like that, helping to share knowledge, hopefully doing it effectively. That's great. If, for me, if I chose to do it all over again, CEO of Nintendo, but there you go. <laughs> well, you know, some of us are built different. Are you though? Next question. <laughs> Alan Lopez Robert. from LA asks, there are only eight black CEOs helming Fortune 500 companies in 2023. What did being black in position of power mean to you? And what policies do you feel private, publicly traded companies should implement for diversity, if any? Uh, wow. Well, Thank you, Reggie. Uh, <laughs> um, 
there should be a lot of policies uh, implemented. And it's not just looking at this through uh, the lens of a black executive. But th the fact of the matter is, you know, for any organization to be effective and successful, you need to have a diversity of thought and opinion driving your initiative, your business, your proposition forward. And when I talk about diversity, I really mean it in its broadest sense possible. Yes, it's ethnic diversity, but it's diversity in upbringing. It's diversity from a language and culture standpoint. All of these things that make us different need to be applied in helping things move forward. And you know, certainly uh, throughout my career, especially at Nintendo, I was a huge advocate for how could we bring diversity in its broadest sense possible into our business and to propel forward. Our employees, our customers, how do we make the products as uh, engaging and appealing to a diverse audience as possible? And we did not do it 100% of the time. You know, at times we failed in pushing that forward. But I can tell you, having that thought of bringing new ideas, new perspectives into every decision possible is critically important. And I have to tell you, a lot of people give it lip service. You know, this is something that I continue to be incredibly passionate on. And you know, I, I sit on boards of publicly held companies, and this is something that I constantly challenge the organization. How do we bring the diverse thoughts and opinions of the employees, of the customers, of the supply base in every single decision possible. So I, it has to be something at the highest leadership levels that is embraced and pushed forward within a company and to never take a, you know, take a stiff arm or no for an answer. So, Louis Jean from Oregon asks, has there been a video game that changed your life for the better? So the, the video game that changed my life for the better literally was The Legend of Zelda uh, Link to the Past. Yeah. Right. And so, so oh, just, no, here, no. here's one, right? So the SNES was my first gaming system that I owned. I had played other gaming systems, but it was the first one that I brought into my house. It came with uh, Super Mario. I played the Super Mario game, finished that with 99 lives. But the, the one that really shaped my relationship with gaming was Zelda Link to the Past. You know, I was working for Pizza Hut at the time. I, you know, I, I would be at work. I would get home, I'd spend time with my two kids, and then I would start to play that adventure. And you know, it was it was like a second job for me. I actually called the Nintendo helpline. <laughs> I couldn't progress past one of the puzzles. Nice. And I, I really do believe that it was that relationship with that game that enabled me to continue my gaming journey to have credibility with the people at Nintendo. Uh, I told the story of my playing Zelda Link to the Past when Mr. Miyamoto was being uh, awarded with a, a Lifetime Achievement Award by the US-based uh, trade group, the ESA. And I told this long, passionate story of me playing the game, getting to the final boss. It literally was 3 o'clock in the morning. I had to get up and go to work the next day. And I was playing, uh, 
and my son had his own game file, and he would see how I've progressed during the game. <laughs> so that morning, I stopped playing at three, I go to work, all I could think of was getting back home, beating the final boss, getting to see the end credits of the game. I get home, I'm walking in the front door, and I hear my son, who's probably around eight at the time, he's squealing with delight. He had found my safe file. <laughs> he had seen where I was, and he had spent, you know, from the time he got home from school, which was probably about three o'clock in the afternoon, until I walked in the door about 6.30, he'd been trying to beat the final boss. And he had literally just done it before I walked in. <laughs> so now, so imagine I'm telling the story as Mr. Miyamoto is being inducted into this you know, prestigious thing. So I, I get back to the table, Mr. Miyamoto, after he has given his, uh, his thank yous, he sits at the table, he's seated next to me, leans over, Reggie son. I said, yes, Mr. Miyamoto. I said, was that story true? <laughs> I said, absolutely, right? This is how you touched me, this is how you touched my family. So I would say the relationship that I had with that game really enabled me to be you know, effective and successful uh, while I was uh, president and CEO of the Nintendo of America. That's great, and that's, it's funny that you mentioned that because I didn't know that story, but the way this kicked off, the way we were able to finally land Reggie, and this has been a dream come true, having you open the show, was like we were on a flight together and we were talking about games. And he was like, what's your favorite Nintendo game? And I was like, Link to the Past. So wow, who knew I was buying such clout? <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think we're out of time. Or you wanna do one more? Uh, uh, we'll do the we'll last do, one. Right, last one, we'll last end on this one. one. This is a heavy hitter, so we really need to get to this one. Oh, snap. All right, so final question. Brittany Roger, Roger. From Los Angeles. Of, cool. of course. <laughs> of course. If you did, how did you like it? <laughs> so, like, I'm assuming many of you, yes, I saw the movie. I saw it in a theater. I've seen it many times since. Loved the movie. Okay. Loved the movie. Even though I wasn't asked, you know, to be in the movie. <laughs> Loved the movie. <laughs> Loved the movie. And, you know, from my perspective, what I loved, I loved all of the fan service that was sprinkled throughout the movie, right? The, the, the GameCube sound when you would load a disc as a ringtone yeah. for Luigi's phone, right? Just as right. a small example of all of the fan service. Uh, you know, I, I loved it. And, you know, I, I had nothing to do with the movie, but I, I do like to believe that I had a small hand to play in building the relationship between uh, the Universal Studios group, which led to the, the relationship with Illumination. Uh, I, I was there at the very first meeting, Mr. Awada, senior executives from, uh, uh, from Universal Studios and, and Comcast Corporate. Uh, so it was, it was just fantastic to see the, uh, you know, this, uh, the seeds of an idea that were brought to life many, many years later. So, love the movie. Ryan, thank you. Thank you. You know, folks that are here, thank you.